From angels bending near the earth To touch their harps of gold Peace on earth, goodwill to men From heaven's all-gracious King The world in solemn stillness lay To hear the angels sing
Lord, we proclaim the gloriousness of your name on this day as we approach Christmas. May we focus our eyes on your coming and put you in the center of our celebrations. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue with our online service. Hello, if we haven't met, my name is Odalis. I'm part of the pastoral team here at Cornerstone SF. I can't believe Christmas is just a week away. I hope you're ready. I hope you're excited for this festive time to get to spend it with some family and friends. I know for some of us, Christmas can be kind of a mixed bag. There's different experiences or emotions that hit us in a unique way at this time of year. And if that's you, my sincere prayer is for the Lord to really meet you in this time for you to feel as you move through the holidays that sense of hopeful anticipation that's sometimes missing at this time of year. And that as you're looking back on it, you feel a sense of warmth and joy in how the time was spent. Really pray for the Lord to meet you this year. Now with Christmas Eve landing on a Sunday, our schedule is a little different, but we have this beautiful opportunity to spend dedicating the day to celebrating the birth of the Lord. We have on Sunday the 24th in the morning, premiering online at nine and at Reardon in person at 10 a.m. our Christmas Eve morning service. We've got some special things that are planned for that service. You don't wanna miss out. Be sure to mark it on your calendar, share it with your friends and family as well. But we wanna just start the day out on the right foot, celebrating together, worshiping together. And then in the evening at 6 p.m. at our Reardon campus only is our candlelight service. Hey, plan on getting there at 5.50. You don't wanna be rushing in the door, you know? Try to get there a little earlier if you can. We've got some things going on pre-service you don't wanna miss. But at six o'clock, we will start our candlelight service. It's a beautiful time full of so much song. Uh, the, the beautiful moment there with the candles, the room lights up. It's just, it's one of my favorite services that we get to do all year. So I hope that we'll get to see you there. This is also our time in the service where we pause for our time of giving, our tithes and our offerings. We give this to the Lord, particularly for those who uh, call Cornerstone their home church, but definitely for anybody who feels motivated or inspired to give. But God has been so faithful to us. It is one of the ways that we practice and express that gratitude and faithfulness back to the Lord. At the end of the year, we are asking everyone to hold Cornerstone a priority in their year-end giving. We're looking at next year as this year of witness. We're looking at Acts 1-8, even calling it the Acts 1-8 initiative to multiply what it is the Lord is doing through our community. He has been so generous to us, giving us so many people with different gifts and skills and talents. He's given us this online community that is just a beautiful thing and we wanna be faithful to that and we wanna be courageous in it. Looking at an Acts 1 8 teaches how the Spirit has empowered us to go to our neighborhoods, to the city, the Bay Area, the state, and because of online, that can go wherever the Lord wants it to go. So we want to be faithful stewards to what God has empowered us with, and we want everyone in the community to be joining this. So please consider Cornerstone a priority in your year in giving, particularly for those who wait until the end of the year and they get very generous at this time of year. If that's you especially, Please consider us. Uh, again, the same ways of giving, and also uh, we can also receive stock donations as well. You can reach out to our finance manager for more information on that. That all being said, Pastor Terry is going to continue our Out of the Silence series. I'd just love to say a quick word of prayer before he does. Would you join me in that? Lord God, we thank you for this service that we get to share together, how you've connected us from all over the place, Lord, from wherever it is we are right now. We're maybe at home, we're in the car, we're out and about, wherever we are, you have gathered us for this moment in particular. You do things with intention, Lord, with specific purpose. And so we pray for your purpose in this time that we have together. Speak to us through this message. We are listening for your voice in our lives, Lord, and we pray for you to help us to be active and attentive and to move in, with obedience towards what it is we hear you say to us today. We thank you for this time, Jesus. We honor you in it, and we pray these things in your good and beautiful name. Amen. Amen. Let's receive the message now together.
Christmas blessings sent your way. Now, most of you are aware, uh, and I'm Pastor Terry, lead pastor at Cornerstone Church in San Francisco, for those of you joining us for the first time. But most of you are aware that for the past few, well, four weeks, leading up to the final week, right before Christmas, the week that we're about to head into, we have focused on the birth of John. Now, we're talking about John, who would later be known as John the Baptist. But we've been actually using this remarkable account of his birth to prepare our hearts for the season, this Christmas season, and for the special moment that we are going to mark when we celebrate the birth of, well, the birth of the Savior, Messiah Jesus. And I'm so looking forward to that moment because it always carries with it a unique blessing. But I want to finish the story, the account of Zechariah, Elizabeth, and the birth of their son, John. And along the way, I want us to be able to draw inspiration from it. Inspiration that I hope and believe will prepare us to be able to receive this special week as the gift it's meant to be. You know, some of us are going to need to discern things heading into the coming year. And yeah, it's hard to believe we're nearing 2024. But as we make our way into Christmas and then into the gift of the new year, with all of its uncertainties and possibilities, my prayer is that the Lord would not only birth new things, but help us to discern the way that we should go. And even now, Lord, I ask that you would bless this word. I do. Bless all my friends, all my brothers and sisters and church online community, those jumping in here right now because someone told them about us or they just discovered it, <laughs> or that you would speak to our hearts and that you would allow us to be able to not only embrace the special, unique gift of Christmas as it is meant to be for us, but also that you would use that to help us, um, yeah, use this message to help us discern the path that we need to take heading into this coming year. That's my prayer. Bless this word, bless our hearts. Help us to hear what it is you want to say to us in Jesus' name. So, a quick refresher. The opening of Luke's gospel tells us that there was this special day <laughs> when a good and godly priest named Zechariah was ministering in the holy place of the temple, which would have been the highlight, by the way, of his priestly career, and we talked a lot about that. It was during that time that a messenger from heaven we're actually given the name of this angel, Gabriel, appeared and told him that he and his wife, Elizabeth, were going to have a son, a son who would have a unique and, if we can put it this way, unprecedented calling, right? He would be given the prophetic privilege of ushering in the way for Messiah. It was something that no other human being would be given the privilege of doing. Well, Zechariah, considered the suggestion or the statement by the angel Gabriel uh, too incredible to believe. I mean, he wanted to believe he was a believer in God. He believed that God did miracles in the past, but that God was actually going to do one in his life with Elizabeth, uh, who was barren, that is unable to have children. And now we, we know advanced in years, they were likely both in midlife stage but let's just say that she was beyond the age where it was realistic to get pregnant, yet alone carry a child to term. So Zechariah had a hard time believing. He had reluctant faith. <laughs> and so he asked for a sign, and the angel gave him one because the angel was not pleased with what should have been received with joy was received with wavering faith at best. Doubt is really what it was. I need more proof before I can believe you. Even though we're having this incredible experience right now, having this communication, I still need more. I need a sign. That's what Zechariah said. And the angel said, you want, <laughs> we've had some fun with this. A sign. You want a sign? All right. I'll give you a sign. You ready? You won't be able to speak until the day when, I, when what I have declared to you is accomplished. 
That's your sign. And let's just say Zechariah didn't have a chance to reply. I mean, <laughs> I mean, he might have tried, but nothing came out. And then the angel was gone. And listen, he <laughs> he finished out his service in silence. The silence that he returned home in, the silence that he waited in for months was in many ways symbolic of the prophetic silence that existed between the last of the Old Testament and the emergence of the new, which begins with the birth of, of Christ. Remember, for 400 years, no word of the Lord was heard, no prophetic word was heard till John emerges. That's actually the gap between the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, and the New Testament. It's almost as if it was the silent prelude to a grand moment, uh, the silent space that preceded the coming song of the Lord, the song of love that he would sing over humanity and giving us his son. Yeah, out of the silence, the song will break. Uh, the word will come and dwell among us. Okay, back to the account, because it's fantastic. I want us to enjoy it together. Now the time came, verse 57, the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And I do want to pause right here and just lay at your feet, especially for those who are getting a little older in the middle years or even in your advanced years. Not that those of you who are young can't relate to this because I think it's actually relevant for every one of us, but I just, you know, no matter what life stage we're in, I just happen to believe that this is a particular word for those who are in your late middle years or your latter years of life and where we sense the impact of the aging process. And indeed, though our outer person is perishing, yet our inner one can be renewed day by day. I just feel like God wants to birth some new things in all of us. And don't fall for, yeah, I'm going to call it the lie or don't allow yourself to be subjected if, as you're getting older to a belief that somehow God can't do new things in us and through us. This couple, though advanced in years, had a faith that was vibrant. Now, it wasn't perfect, as Zechariah's silence attested to, but it was vibrant and it was alive. And as a result, God was able to bring forth life in and through them. And may it be so with us, Lord. May it be so with us, Lord. Keep, keep me alive in you. Keep me running. Keep me moving. Keep me always on the grow. Yeah, that growing edge, the vibrant life. That's what we want. I, I'm reminded of one of my favorite quotes from John Milton's poem, where he says, at last he rose and twitched his mantle blue tomorrow to fresh woods and pastures anew. I love that. At last he rose and twitched his mantle blue tomorrow to fresh woods and pastures anew. That's, that's the growing life. <laughs> that's the life of new beginning. That's the life of tomorrows. That's our choice, you know, how we want to enter into it. Okay, back to our account, verse 58, and her neighbors, because she was the time had come for her to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. First off, let's just make this really clear, how wonderful it is to have people in our lives to rejoice with. Do we realize how wonderful that is to have people in our lives to rejoice with? Don't underestimate its value. Family, friends, small groups, ministry teams, a church community, people we love, people we care about, people who care, care about us and who love us, right? Who will rejoice with us. They'll, they'll share in our pain and they'll share in our joy. And that reminds me of one of those quotes that tends to stay with me. 
when it comes to friendship and love and people who care for us. Shared pain, half the pain. When I can let others know the hurt I'm walking through, the disappointment I feel, but share joy, twice the joy. <laughs> we rejoice together. Shared pain, half the pain, shared joy, twice the joy. Now, perhaps Zechariah had looked to the day when he too could rejoice. Because the angel has said, you will not be able to speak until the day these things take place. Well, I wonder if after the excitement of the birth of his son, Zechariah wondered if, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> when am I going to get my <laughs> capacities back? I mean, the implication was he couldn't actually not only speak, but he, he couldn't hear as well. And we'll see that. When they try to communicate with him, he, they have to write down things. So the moment comes, the baby comes, the baby's born, his baby son. Okay, I'm ready. But nothing changed. Maybe he was trying to communicate with Elizabeth. I don't know. It would be seven days of a different kind of silence. Hmm. On the eighth day, verse 59, the eighth day they came to circumcise the child and they would have called him Zechariah after his father. You know, okay, it was the custom to name the son at the time of the circumcision because when Abram was circumcised, God gave him a new name, Abraham. So on the eighth day, eight, not so coincidentally, being the number of new beginning, Seven completion, eight new beginning. Eight on this number, this, this eighth day, this number of new beginning, family and friends converged to celebrate the circumcision and the naming of Elizabeth and Zechariah's son. So it's going to be a big deal here. It's about to happen. <laughs> and they collectively assumed, decided almost, that he would be named, this baby boy, this kind of miracle guy showing up into the world, would be named Zechariah you know, like his father. So, Zach Jr., Zachariah II. But when they said that, yeah, look what it says. His mother answered, no, 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 no. His name will not be Zachariah Jr. or Zachariah II. His name shall be called John. It was a swift corrective. No, his name is John which means the Lord is gracious. The Lord has shown favor, John. <laughs> and I imagine old Uncle Jeb sitting there in the corner, or John, why John? You know, <laughs> a lot of them joining in. Yeah, we don't even have a John in our, no, no, no. His name is John. And they said to her, Look, none, of, none of your relatives are named John. Why can you, why are you guys calling him John? There's no, none of us are named John. Like that's not our name. That's not the kind of name that we use in our family. And he's your firstborn son. He should be named after his father. You know what, Elizabeth? We're gonna, we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna check with Zechariah. Basically, we're gonna try to over. It's, that's an override mo move. Okay, okay. You don't want to. You want to name him John? We're gonna talk to Zechariah. We're gonna ask Zechariah what he wants. And they made signs. Look at this. They made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote his name is John, emphatic. And they all wondered, what? They turned to Zechariah, assuming he will be the one to set things straight. A lot of family drama here. <laughs> <laughs> right? He points to the tablet and he writes emphatically, his name is John. And they all wondered. The, the older version says they marveled, dumbfounded, taken aback. But before they could even fully process it, something else happened. Silence was broken. And I just love this broken in praise, right? So they say, Zechariah, see that it's just like a, a Movement, quick movements. Zechariah, what are you going to say about this? What do you want him called? His name is John. 
And they're going, what? And then as soon as they're that, he breaks out in praise. The whole thing was startling. An amazing sequence. First, he writes the name. They're stunned as to why. Then, boom, he breaks forth into praise. And look what it says, verse 64. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, blessing God and fear, not the fear of terror, but of awe, wonder, and amazement. Come on all of their neighbors. And all of these things, they, they, they were talked about through, uh, through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him, the Bible says. And then his father, Zechariah, I love this, I love this, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, you know, the, the power of the Lord comes upon him. The anointing of the Lord bursts through him. He starts speaking out, blessing and praise and prophecy. It's what will be known in the ancient Christian church as the Benedictus, the blessed, because it was the first word of Zechariah's prophecy in the Latin text, the Benedictus. Look what he says. Look what he cries out. Look what he sings out. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. For he has visited and redeemed his people and raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of the holy prophets, of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And then this marvelous conclusion, which guides us perfectly into Christmas so beautifully like a ship coming into the harbor. Ah, oh, watch it. I'm going to have us read this from the NLT because I like the slight subtlety of the arrangement. Verse 76, and you, ah, oh, I see Zechariah turning to his newborn son, just named on the eighth day, John, with tears in his eyes and the quiver in his voice, singing praise to God and you, my little son oh, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare the way for the Lord and you will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins by calling them to repentance and pointing them to Messiah Jesus. Because of God's tender mercy, what a description of an aspect of God's character. Because of God's tender mercy, Ah, oh, the morning light from heaven. Look at this. Oh, light of the world. The morning light from heaven is about to break upon us. The older version says day spring. The word day spring means morning light. The aurora, which is the Latin word for dawn, the rising of the sun. The morning light from heaven is about to break upon us. The new day is beginning the, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. Look what it says to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. Oh. Oh, so as we make our way, as we make our way into uh, this wonderful, wonderful week, this Christmas week, as we make our way into the Christmas week, let us remember that we have been given the invitation of a few things, haven't we, that are just captured vividly and beautifully in the 79th verse. Well, actually, verse 78 as well. Firstly, you and I, come on now, are being invited to live in his tender mercy. I'll just let that sit. Not just the tender mercy of his coming, which the Christ child reveals God's tenderness and full vulnerability. I'm talking about the baby Jesus, the one in the manger. But we're also being invited to 
yeah, experience his tender mercy. Some of us may need that really badly. We might need that right now. We might need his tender mercy. That's what I'm thinking about. That's what I was being impre impressed with. That there might be some of us who are feeling pretty, pretty beat up. Or maybe we're feeling a little bit hurt or maybe we're feeling um, something of the pain of life and, and just uh, what we're having to walk through. And we're being invited to be loved and cared for by a holy God who wants to help us and heal us. That's what I, I want some of you to hear, like his tender mercy for you, you that he wants to heal you and help you and he wants to help us and heal us, right? This is, this is the invitation of Christmas, the God who heals, the God who is vulnerable, the God who meets us in our vulnerability, the God who is safe. Yeah, it's true. As C.S. Lewis said, he's dangerous, yes, in the sense that he's holy and powerful, but he's also loving and kind and tender and it's no, it's never represented more beautifully than in the baby, the, the Christ child. And what else are we told from verse 78, the tender mercy to 79, to give light to those who sit in darkness, that is to be enlightened by his light. That's another thing that we are being invited into, not only to live in his tender mercy, but to be enlightened by his light and to be warmed by his love. And then to be filled with and guided, here it is, by his peace. That's settledness of soul. Do you see how beautiful the invitation is? To live in his light, to live in his love, and to walk in his peace uh, in the places where we need it most, some of us in our minds, some of it in our relationships. Where do you need the peace? Where do we need his light? Where do we need his love? Where do we need his tender mercy? Oh, Lord Jesus. We're so open to receive. Thank you, thank you so much for being our day star, our day spring, our new beginning. <sighs> yeah, warm us in your love. Let's keep that in mind as we share this song and then I'll come back around. I do have something I wanna say about how we, I think we should be approaching these coming days. So I'll do that in a minute, but here we go. Joyful, joyful, we adore Thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before Thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. Rejoice, rejoice. Bye. 
kiss which the morning stars began father love is reigning o'er us brotherly love binds man to man ever singing march we onward victors in the midst of strife joyful music leads us sunward in the triumph song of life so I want us all to be blessed. We've got this wonderful opportunity, this Christmas week, just right in front of us. What should we do? I have four specific things I'd like you to consider. One, sit with the story. Sit with the story. Honor Christmas in our hearts. Prepare for a special time on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. In other words, just engage, engage the story of the birth of Jesus. Stay close to it for the whole week. And then the other thing I would suggest, <laughs> I would, is sing the songs with joy and wonder. Engage the carols, why not? Just go for it, sing them. Maybe you've heard them hundreds of times. It's okay, they're worth it. They bring things alive, remember? Song is a gift. Sing them joyfully to the Lord. Joy to the world, O little town of Bethlehem, silent night. Just sing the song, sing the carols, be refreshed, be made alive in them. Keep a heart of a child, stay full of wonder. Sing the songs, you have breath in your being, sing it out. And then thirdly, share the story and invite others into it. I really want to encourage you to invite others. If you're listening online from a distance, invite others to share what we're gonna do next week. If you're able though, I'd love for you to invite people to come and be with us next Sunday on either the Christmas Eve morning service or the candlelight service in the evening. Just to actually be able to be present would be a huge, beautiful gift and to be able to invite someone to that who maybe just because it's Christmas, they're open. They're open, right? So share Christ, whether online, in presence, I just want to encourage us to not keep it to ourselves, but to be courageous in our faith and, and just invite, I mean, maybe send out hundreds of invites. I know that's daring, but one life can be changed and that affects generations. You'll never know the good that can potentially happen because you are allowing yourself to be an inviter of someone who could end up changing the lives of hundreds and thousands of people down the years for the goodness of God, all because one thing was shared, one invitation was made. That could be what God wants all of us to do. Don't underestimate what happens through a simple invitation. And then lastly, I just wanna lay this before us. Set the day aside. I'm talking about December 24th in particular. Make an entire day of it. Uh, really try to consecrate or set aside that time to honor Jesus. For those of you who are able to be here in presence, just do it like say i'm going to be there in the morning and i'm going to come back in the evening and the entire midsection of the day is just going to be a way of preparing my heart to receive the gift of jesus to celebrate his coming and just honoring him the whole day through so may you be filled with the blessing of christ may his joy life and love be yours may we have a fantastic beautiful lovely grace-filled week and then we break out in song and praise for Jesus, God's ultimate gift. You're so loved. Merry Christmas. <laughs>